Hey, hey folks, welcome back. So I think this is gonna be the last video on this channel for the year. And so if I don't get a chance to wish you at the end of the video, happy holidays and happy new year. And whether this is the first video you're watching on this channel or you've been a long time viewer, thank you so much for watching, it means a lot. So for this video, I wanted to get back into our series where we've been using data science to trade stocks. And to be honest, I got a little bit stuck. For the last few videos in the series, we used increasingly complicated models like the ARMA model, the GBDT, LSTM models to pick and day trade stocks. Now, the natural progression would see us use even more complicated models like transformers, but I didn't want to do that just yet. It felt right now like the right thing to do was to actually go back to basics. And I'm talking a revival of the strategy from the very, very first video in the series, but applied to a topical subsection of the market, namely grocery store and retail store stocks. There's just been a ton of buzz around these companies lately, whether we're talking about the flattening of Target stock as consumers are turned off by higher and higher prices, or whether we're talking about the failed merger of supermarket giants Kroger and Albertsons. I really felt like there had to be something we could take advantage of in this dynamically changing grocery store sector, even if and maybe especially if we use a simple model like the one we used in our very first video. And to that end, we're going to limit the pool of available stocks today to just those publicly traded companies which sell groceries as a decent part of their products. So I want you to think of things like Kroger, Albertsons, Sprouts, Target, Walmart, Costco, stuff like that. Our model, again, is a slight variation on the graph theory and sharp ratio based model we used in the very first video on this channel. Brief recap, we start by taking the daily stock return time series for each of these tickers through 2024. We work in rolling windows where a month of data gets used to train the strategy and the next week is used to validate the strategy and see what return we would have gotten relative to the S&P 500, which we consider as our baseline. The training phase is pretty simple, folks. We start by creating a graph where each ticker is a node and the edges are weighted by the correlation between the stock returns. We only create an edge if the correlation is bigger than the threshold, and that threshold is tuned as part of this process. More on that in just a second. After this first phase where we've created that correlation graph, we end up with a graph with some number of connected components that looks like this, for example. We see in this graph, for example, there are three connected components. We pick the quote unquote best ticker from each connected component, and that means the one that has the highest sharp ratio, as long as that ratio is at least 0.25 to make sure that it's some, some notion of goodness. Now there's a bit to unpack there. First, what the heck is a sharp ratio? It's pretty simple and it's defined as the expected return from a ticker during the training period minus the expected return from a risk-free investment during that same period, and that's what goes in the numerator. That risk-free investment, by the way, is usually calculated as the yield on a short-term government bond, and that's what we're going to use here. The denominator is the standard deviation of the ticker's return. In a nutshell, higher sharp ratios are considered good because they mean that we either have a higher return relative to a risk-free investment, a small volatility for that return, or both. I'll admit here that the 0.25 threshold on this ratio is somewhat anecdotal and can definitely be tuned as well. Suppose that after this we're left with three tickers, A, B, and C, having sharp ratios 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and 0 0.3 respectively. Now let's take our $1,000 that we want to invest and invest proportional to these sharp ratios. So what that means is we're going to invest $417 into A, $333 into ticker B, and $250 that remain into ticker C. We let those investments mature for a week and we see what kind of return we get. I will say here, a really important thing is that if we ever have zero grocery stocks left, because none of the sharp ratios were high enough, we default to putting our entire $1,000 investment into the S&P 500. So that's gonna be our fallback. Now remember folks that we're gonna have one such experiment for each threshold that we pick on the minimum correlation needed to create an edge in the graph. So overall, we get a distribution of returns for each of these possible thresholds. A final note and something that we hinted at earlier is that we're actually going to measure the excess return from our strategy relative to just investing our money in the S&P 500 for that same week since we're only really successful if we do better than that much easier, much more passive strategy. Now, with the method explained, we're ready to dig into our results. First, I just wanted to sandy check by showing that if the threshold needed to create a graph edge gets higher, then we see that the distribution of the number of edges in the graph shifts more and more to the left, which makes total sense. I personally find that when you have a lot of moving parts like we do here, these little sanity checks are really helpful to make sure that there's no bugs in your code or your methodology. Now we're gonna take a look at the distribution of these excess returns, again, relative to the S&P 500, for each of the different edge creation thresholds that we're trying out. 
And we see, drumroll please, da 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 da, very anticlimactically that no matter what threshold we choose, we are losing a good amount of money versus just investing that thousand dollars in the S&P 500. We see from the distributions that it's possible for this strategy to work, given that there's some density in these distributions higher than zero for many of these graphs. But statistically, on average, most of these strategies are going to be very likely to fail. Now we know that it's likely to fail, but maybe we should get a sense of why. Why are they likely to fail? To get a sense of that, we can plot the daily returns of each grocery ticker that we're considering versus the daily returns of the S&P 500. We see that in most cases, the S&P 500 return is very close to that of the individual ticker, meaning that there just may not be too much on average additional value in trying to build a whole strategy around these individual tickers using as simple of a strategy as we're using today. Even looking at this case with the SFM ticker, Sprouts Farmers Market, who has earned five times the expected return of the S&P 500 on average, we see that the spread of these returns is much higher. In other words, more return here comes with more risk, and at the end of the day, the S&P 500 is a collection of these grocery stocks, yes, but also stocks from all of the other industries in the market, giving it that trademark diversity which makes it so successful, even compared to these fancy data science strategies that we have been trying and that we tried today. So to recap, is it possible? Is it possible to build a strategy around trading grocery store stocks? Well, yes, it likely is, but will that strategy deliver consistent returns outpacing just investing in the market? Probably not. Given that our Monte Carlo simulations all say that investing using the strategy is a bad idea, we're going to, for the first time in the series, actually not invest our money using the strategy we came up with and just put that money in the market instead. We find that by doing so, we made $2.30 on our $1,000 investment during the week that we've chosen to test. And, and folks, if we had chosen to use the strategy outlined in this video instead, where we actually do pick some grocery store stocks and allocate according to the Sharpe ratio, then folks, we would have lost four and a half dollars in that same week. So it looks like we did make a good choice here by not choosing to use the strategy. Oh, and just for fun here, here's a look at which grocery tickers got the most and least investment during our experiment. Unsurprisingly, we see that the S&P 500 got the most investment. Remember that it was a fallback if no tickers met the Sharpe ratio requirements, which happened pretty often. The top three after that that got the most investments were Sprouts, Farmers Market, Costco, and Natural Grocers. And the bottom three were Grocery Outlet, Albertsons, and Target. So folks, if you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Any comments are welcome below. Have a great, great holiday season and new year, and I'll see all you wonderful people next year.